Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to be talking about one of the most familiar yet misunderstood forces of nature, that is, gravity. In this video, we'll look at the effects of gravity at different scales, from objects in your room to outer space. As we move on, the explanations will get more in-depth, but I'll do my best to simplify things. If you wanted an hour-long physics lecture, you probably wouldn't be here. So let's start at the human level. As you go down to the surface of the Earth, you find that it's essentially flat. That assumption lets us simplify physics a lot without losing much accuracy. This is the level where we actually live, so we understand it the best, but there are still some misconceptions. For example, there's the old Aristotelian idea that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. This little myth has stuck around for millennia, and I've even seen it in the opposite direction. Someone watched a physics video and thought that the speaker meant heavier objects actually fall slower. So, to be clear, objects of different weights will actually fall at the same rate, as long as there are no other forces at play. The main reason why Aristotle and countless others have made this mistake is due to air resistance. If I drop a piece of paper in a tennis ball, we all know that the tennis ball will hit the ground first, but that's only because of air resistance. If I instead crumple up that piece of paper very tightly, things change. The paper is still lighter than the tennis ball, but now they hit the ground at about the same time. That's because air resistance has been significantly reduced. Now, when I started researching this video, I found that Aristotle had tried to account for air resistance by saying the speed was inversely proportional to the density of the fluid. That was his way of explaining why things fall slower in water. But if we actually look at the equation, it still has some big problems. Inversely proportional is a fancy way of saying divided by. So we divide the mass by the density of the fluid, and that causes some major problems when you enter a vacuum. The density in a vacuum becomes nearly zero, which means the speed starts to approach infinity. So if this was true, that would mean that inside a vacuum chamber, a ball would fall at almost infinite speed, which is really terrifying if you think about it because it would essentially turn vacuum chambers into bombs. Obviously, this all breaks down very quickly, especially when we start to look at the motion of the solar system. But for now, let's stay at the human level and talk about actual physics and why objects fall at the same rate. More specifically, they accelerate at the same rate, starting at zero, then increasing speed over time until they reach their terminal velocity. To understand this, start by imagining a single ball. If we drop it, it will fall at a set rate. If we put an identical second ball right next to it, they should both still fall at that same rate. Now imagine if we took those two balls and we stuck them together. Technically, this has become a single object that is twice as heavy, but the objects are still essentially falling next to each other. So they end up falling at the same rate they did on their own. They're just a little closer together. In the absence of air resistance, this holds true no matter how many balls we're dropping at once. They will all fall at the same rate. If you prefer a more mathematical explanation, we can say that each ball has a mass of 1 and feels a force of 1. Acceleration is the force divided by the mass, so 1 divided by 1 equals 1. With 2 balls, that force goes up to 2, but so does the mass. 2 divided by 2 is still 1. With 10 balls, there is a force of 10 and a mass of 10. Acceleration is still equal to 1. It doesn't matter how much weight you give an object because it always gains more mass to counter that force. This is Newton's first law in action. Massive objects take more force to accelerate. In other words, they have more inertia. This is, of course, at the human scale where air resistance is only important for very light objects like pieces of paper, and the Earth is flat, unmoving, and has constant downward gravity. So at this level, basic Newtonian physics is your bread and butter. Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, allows us to derive the kinematic equations, which can answer almost all the questions on your first physics exam. How long will it take this ball to hit the ground? About 0.45 seconds. How high will this cannon shoot? About 510 meters. But as that cannon gets more and more powerful, weird things start to happen. Instead of falling straight back down, the ball is landing to the west of us. And when it's fired at an angle, the flight path is no longer a perfect parabola. The assumptions we made are breaking down because the Earth isn't flat, or static. The force of gravity pulls objects towards the center of the Earth, and over long distances that means the direction of down actually changes. The Earth also rotates beneath objects while they're in flight, 
So as the cannonball flies higher in the atmosphere, it appears to drift in the opposite direction. We're now approaching the planetary scale where things will be getting a bit more complicated. Unfortunately, I haven't taken my full orbital dynamics class yet, so I'm less familiar with equations for this part, but I have a rough understanding of how things work. Now we're going to assume that objects move in ellipses. The parabolas we see on the ground are essentially the tip of a very narrow ellipse that runs all the way to the center of the Earth and back. Now, you can't just have that ellipse any which way you want because its shape is actually tied to the gravity of Earth. In fact, one of the focal points of the ellipse must be at the center of the Earth. If you want to know more about what a focal point is, you can check out this Khan Academy video, but for now I'll just show you this animation of how changing focal points affects the orbit. You can also change the semi-major axis, which is this distance, and that will change how big and round your ellipse is. <sighs> Only technical terms here, folks. But anyway, there is a link to the simulation in the description if you want to experiment for yourself. So now that you have a better idea of how objects move around a planet, let's take a closer look at that cannon. In one of Newton's famous thought experiments, aptly named Newton's Cannon, he imagined that there was a cannon on top of a high mountain. As you increase the power of that cannon, the distance the ball traveled would increase. With more and more power, these distances get very large, and the path of motion starts to look like an ellipse. If you continue to increase the power of the cannon, you eventually reach a point where you're shooting halfway around the planet. Then, if you added a little more power, the cannonball would go all the way around the Earth, just miss the other side, and smack you in the back of the head. <coughs> okay, so... <coughs> this type of motion is called an orbit. And though it doesn't work very well in the atmosphere, it does apply in space. And now is probably a good time to dispel one of the biggest myths about space. There actually is gravity in space. In fact, it's actually the force of gravity that's keeping objects like moons and planets and even hypothetical cannonballs in orbit. The moon is essentially a giant cannonball circling the Earth, and the Earth is essentially a giant cannonball circling the Sun. Now if you're still confused about why objects move in orbits, you can check out a demonstration I did a little over a year ago. Sorry in advance about the wind in that video, but I still think it's an effective explanation. Now another question you might be asking is why things are weightless in space if there's still gravity. And this brings us back to the beginning of this video, where I talked about objects falling at the same rate. I had the example of two balls falling close together and how they didn't affect each other. And that's exactly what's happening when you're weightless. You and your spaceship are actually both falling, but because you're falling at the same rate, you feel like you're floating around inside it. This is why people describe orbits as falling around the Earth, why planes can fly in parabolas and create weightlessness, and why you feel weightless on roller coasters. The weightless feeling is the same as the feeling of falling. And just to visualize this, here's a balloon to represent your body. When it's on the ground, it's squished. This is the weight that we feel on the ground. But while the balloon's falling, it returns to a rounder shape. And this is the feeling of weightlessness. You can see that the same thing happens to balloons on the ISS, showing that it's all about falling and not a lack of gravity. And again, I'll take a moment to clear something up here. There is some debate about what to call weightlessness. Depending what dictionary you use, weight can be described as everything from mass to how much something weighs. Real informative dictionary.com. In physics though, weight has a much more specific definition which I'll read verbatim. Weight is the force that gravitation exerts on a body equal to the mass of the body times the local acceleration of gravity, commonly taken in a region of constant gravitational acceleration as a measure of mass. So what that definition is saying is that we usually take mass and weight to mean the same thing. But this is only because we live in a relatively constant gravitational field. If you visited Mars, you would actually weigh less, but you would still have the same mass. And this confusion also causes some problems when we're going between imperial and metric units because pounds is actually a measure of force, while kilograms is a measure of mass. Mass in imperial is measured in slugs, and force in metric is actually described by newtons. So the point I'm trying to make is that in orbit you aren't literally weightless. There's still gravitational acceleration, and you still have mass. That means you do experience a force, even though you don't notice it because you're floating. Or falling, I guess. 
There are some other names for this phenomenon, including zero-g and microgravity, both of which are also technically incorrect. Zero-g suggests that g, the gravitational acceleration, is zero, but on the ISS it's actually about 8.66 meters per second squared, which is decidedly non-zero. Similarly, microgravity also implies that gravity is very small, which, like I've said many times now, is not the case. In fact, if you're orbiting close to something heavier, like the Sun or Jupiter, your gravitational acceleration is actually going to be higher than it would be on Earth, but you still feel weightless. Despite the problems with the word, NASA has chosen microgravity as their go-to term for things floating. And on their website, they give the explanation that things just appear to experience little gravity in space. So yes, even NASA has to admit that the term they use is technically inaccurate. But to be honest, I can't think of a good word to describe this feeling. The best I've come up with is just calling it falling. But even that runs into some problems if you're in deep space or at a Lagrange point. Maybe the only truly accurate word I can think of is groundlessness. But that also means based on no facts, so that opens up a whole new can of worms. English really was not made with space in mind, was it? Anyway, this video is getting pretty long now, my voice is dying, and I'm probably getting tired of editing it. So I'll give you some homework, then let you go. So far, we've made it from the surface of the Earth to a low Earth orbit. But in the real solar system, things get a bit more complicated. There are other planets, moons, the sun, and even asteroids start to mess with you if you get close enough. This larger system allows for all kinds of weird things, like Lagrange points, which I mentioned earlier, which is where forces balance, such that you stay locked with a planet even though you're in a different orbit. And now, I am well outside my area of expertise, or at least understanding, so I'm going to send you off to another video to learn more. This is Dan Burns, explaining and performing demos of gravity using an elastic sheet. He gives very intuitive explanations for everything from moons and binary stars to dark energy. And he even shows why all the planets ended up orbiting in the same direction. So if you want to learn a little more about gravity, this is definitely worth a watch. Not that it really needs a shout out from me at this point. But anyway, that's where I'm going to end this video. Sorry it took so long, I have been busy with school, but if I'm honest, I could have spent more time getting this out sooner. Nonetheless, I hope you learned something and found it interesting. I'm Gran Hathi, and I'll- wait, wait, wait. I actually hit 1,000 subscribers in like this past week, which is really cool. I know my content has changed a lot over the years, so you probably didn't all join for the same reason, and a fair number of you probably don't watch my channel anymore, but it's still really cool to me that at some point 1,000 people were willing to click the subscribe button because apparently my content was worth keeping an eye on, um, so thank you for that. But anyway, back to the outro, I'm Con Hathi, and I will see you in the next video.